Paul. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, Solana Spaces webinar. Uh, today we have Pedro Tradesete, and he likes to free Bana lattices. Okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pedro. Thank you. That was Thank a terrible you. joke, but sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the, for the invitation and for, for arranging the seminar. Um, so yes, um, I'm going to speak about free banner lattices. Um, there's no exclamation mark at the end, so it's just, it's just the title. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is based on several joint works with uh, some Spanish colleagues, uh, Antonio Aviles, Jose Rodriguez, and, and Nacho Villanueva. And, and I also plan to mention some newer results which are still work in progress with, um, with some people I already saw they, they, they had connected. Uh, Timur Oikber, Mitchell Taylor, Vladimir Troitsky, and Nils Lautzen. So, uh, okay, let me start by trying to explain first uh, what is the motivation or my motivation in, in, in this line of research. So, uh, okay, we have a Banach lattice, uh, which is nothing more but a Banach space, which also has a vector lattice structure, right? So we can, we have an order and, and, and we can speak about the soup or the inf of two elements in our, in our lattice. And, and the norm has this um, monotonicity uh, condition, right? So you, you can define the absolute value of some element exactly the way you define it in, in the reals. And with that definition, uh, if x is in absolute value smaller than y, then the norm of x has to be smaller than the norm of y. So in a way, we have um, three uh, different structures on an Abanach lattice. So we have this vector space structure, uh, we have an order structure, which is like happens to be a lattice structure, and we have some topology given by the norm. And these three things are well related, okay? And, and basically, uh, will a big part of the theory is to understand how these three structures are related. So one of my main motivations uh, here is to understand to what extent Banach spaces are different from uh, Banach lattices, okay? Or wh what is the difference between Banach space category and the Banach lattice category, right? So, of course, because uh, every Banach lattice, it's a Banach space, uh, the aim I want to, I mean, the, the kind of thing I want to do here is to do the opposite thing, to associate to a given Banach space, associate uh, a Banach lattice and, and do it in a way that it reflects the Banach space properties right, of the original object. So, um, well, one, of course, one way of doing this is if you take E uh, Banach space, well, of course, you can you can always embed it in some Banach lattice, like, like the space of continuous functions on the, on the dual, right? And, and this space, this is a Banach lattice, and of course it, it, it reflects some of the properties of, of a Banach space, like, uh, I don't know, like separability or things like that. But it is really a very different um, object. So the kind of thing we want to do is, is, is to construct something which is a closure. Okay, to, to a Banach space. I will try to make this more precise in a minute. Uh, well, just one comment on, on the category I'm, I'm working with. So we have, uh, on one side, we have Banach spaces and the, morphis, the morphisms we are dealing with are, of course, bounded linear operators. And on the other side, uh, I will be working with Banach lattices and the morphisms will be the lattice of morphisms, okay, which, which means a lattice homomorphism is, of course, a linear mapping, which also preserves these lattice operations, the suprema and, and infima. Okay, so it is true that in, in, in the literature you can find several works about, for instance, injective Banach lattices, 
when you consider a different category, the category given by with the morphisms, with the morphisms are positive operators and not just lattice homomorphisms. And these work well for some purposes, but uh, not for the one we, we want to address here. The good thing, uh, well, there are good and bad things about this category if you want to compare it with, I mean, the Banach lattice category with, with lattice homomorphisms. If you want to compare it with the Banach spaces, um, well, the first problem you find is that the sum of morphisms need not be a morphism anymore. Okay, if you start with two lattice homomorphisms, the sum in general is not going to be a lattice homomorphism. And so this makes a difference with, with, when you're dealing with just linear bounded operators. There's also an issue with duality, if you want. If, if you start with the Banach lattice, uh, um, if you take a lattice homomorphism and you take the adjoint of that operator, this is, this is no longer a lattice homomorphism in general. So that also makes a difference for, for, some, for some purposes. Okay, well, just to illustrate that maybe they are not exactly um, behaving, these two categories, they are of course not behaving in, in exactly the same way, but let us see that they are not so different if we use the right uh, objects to look at, okay? And this will be, um, this will be done by uh, looking at the free Banach lattice generated by a Banach space. Okay, so what is this? Um, so you start with a Banach space, E, and well, I'm going to call uh, this FBL of E, the free Banach lattice generated by E. This is going to be a Banach lattice, of course, and it is also equipped with some linear isometric embedding from the original Banach space into this uh, Banach lattice. And this embedding has this extra property, which is some universality property, as you might hope if you have been dealing with all the free objects. And it can be written in the following way. So suppose um, you take an arbitrary Banach lattice X and, and an a linear operator from your Banach space E into X, then we can always extend this uh, linear operator into a lattice homomorphism, okay? And this extension is, it's, it's, it's going to be unique. And moreover, the norm, it's preserved. Okay? It, it, it's not, I mean, the norm does, is not going to increase. The norm of this new object, this new lattice homomorphism. So, okay, I insist, I started with just a Banach space and of course, um, the only thing I'm asking about T is that it's linear and bounded. And what I get now, it's this uh, lattice homomorphism, right? So I'm, in a way, this is the kind of correspondence I want to, I, I was mentioning in the, in the previous slide. I, I start with Banach spaces and linear operators, and I get Banach lattices and lattice homomorphisms, okay? So, well, the first thing one should uh, care when introducing this object is uh, what about the existence of, of this creature, right? And, well, in, the, <clears throat> in 2015, um, Ben Pachter and Tony Wixett uh, published in a paper the first um, um, examples of free Banach lattices. In, in their work, they were actually studying uh, the free Banach lattice generated by a set, okay? So there were no Banach space uh, involved. But in our terminology, uh, this would correspond exactly to the free Banach lattice of some L1 space over uh, a given index set, okay? And they proved this, this exists. And this is, a, this is a very interesting paper because it, it, it really opens uh, many questions about uh, this category of Banach lattice and lattice homomorphisms. They, they study, for instance, uh, well, they start the study of, of projective objects, of course, free objects in this category. And, 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 and well, we, we took this as, as a starting point and well, we were trying to, 
to address some some of the questions that that were uh, were raised in this in this paper, and we realized that actually uh, in, in 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 this is a joint work with with Antonio Aviles and Jose Rodriguez from Murcia. We actually proved that a similar thing can be done for an arbitrary banner space, right? So you give me any banner space, and we can construct. Uh, this free banner lattice over E satisfying uh, this uh, universal property. Okay. Actually, um, our proof it's uh, constructive in in a in a sense. So it's not only an existence proof, but we can actually identify or or show a way to construct this this free uh, banner lattice. And, and what's even more uh, important for us, we, we can compute the norm of elements in there, right? Which, which was not uh, not completely evident from from the pacter wickstead uh, approach. Okay, so um, in order to to do this, um, let me just introduce a bit of notation. So. E is a Banach space, um, as, as, as it will be throughout the talk. And I'm going to call H of E the, the space of positively homogeneous functions, which are defined on the, on the dual, the, on the Banach space dual of E, and taking values in the reals. And for such a function, for such a positively homogeneous function, I'm going to define the following norm. Um, so let us take a collection, a finite collection of vectors x i j or x sorry x i star in 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 they are in the dual of e star right and 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 with satisfying this supremum uh, against I mean the supremum of the sum of the absolute values evaluated at points on the ball is going to be smaller than one. So if you're familiar with this absolutely summing um, terminology, that would be the same as saying that the weak one summing norm of this sequence of x a stars is, is smaller than one, right? I don't know if I think it's something like this, right? And 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 for such a collection of vectors, we evaluate the function f on those, take the absolute values and sum them up. And then you take the soup of those uh, finite sums. And well, this is a norm, this is a lattice norm. And, and we'll see uh, what happens next. Um, in particular, uh, we have well, maybe I should mention before um, these functions f we are considering here, they need to be linear, right? I mean, if they were linear, uh, this is this inequality is trivially true, right? So, because saying that this um, sorry saying that this uh, supremum is finite is essentially the same as saying uh, you're mapping f from E star uh, into the reals is mapping weakly summable sequences to strongly summable sequences, right? So it's what we call a absolutely summing or one summing map between the dual of E and, and, and the reals, right? So of course, uh, because the reals is a one dimensional space, uh, if every finite, every linear mapping will, will satisfy uh, that this soup is finite, okay? So, so here we are really dealing with functions which are not necessarily linear. Well, the linear ones are precisely the, the evaluations, okay? So in particular, if I take a point x in, in my original Banach space E, I can take delta of x uh, to be just the evaluation, which at each point in the dual gives me x star on x. And what we proved uh, in our paper is that the free Banach lattice over E, it's precisely taking 
the LAT is generated by this evaluation mappings delta of x for x in, in your original space E. And uh, well, and take the closure with respect to this norm. So maybe one, one comment before uh, I go further. Uh, what do I mean by the sub lattice generated by these deltas? Uh, well, you just take things which are finite linear and lattice combinations of deltas, right? This, this would be the sub lattice generated by this thing. So, so I can have elements which are like this, right? And then, and so on. But always a finite expression on, of course, I could say sum this with delta of x4, with x5, and so on. And, and, and then I, I take the closure of all these finite expressions with respect to, to the free norm, the one I've justified. Okay, and well, one, ha one can prove that this is exactly the, the free space. In, in, in a minute, I will, I will try to explain and I will try to convince you why this expression, uh, why such an expression, right? Okay. But before, we, before that, uh, let me just mention that, uh, and this is an immediate thing to see, is, is that if I take this mapping delta, which is just mapping uh, to every point the corresponding evaluation, right, the one, the linear one I mentioned, uh, this happens to be a, an isometry, a linear isometry, okay? So if you go back to the definition I was saying, what, what, what sorry, what is the, what is a free Banach lattice? It's, it's not just a, a Banach lattice. I need to, to distinguish, a, I have to, to look at a particular embedding, a, a particular isometric embedding of, of, my, of, of my original Banach space into the, into the free, free Banach lattice, okay? So in, in this, um, with this uh, choice of, of well, with, with this uh, notation, this is, this is the, the linear isometry. Okay, so, so before I go, um, I, I want to explain, so the, the aim of the talk is to explain uh, how this free Banach lattice uh, reflects uh, properties of the original space E. Okay, so I start with the Banach space E, which has whatever property P, uh, Banach space property, of course. I want to to know what is the lattice property that the free space has. Okay, but uh, before we start uh, mentioning some of this, uh, as I said, let me try to convince you why the evolve the, the, the previous expression I gave for the norm actually works. And well, this is uh, maybe an easy observation, but I think it it helps clarify. Um, the expression for the norm. So imagine, okay, let, let, let's take um, this uh, finite collection of vectors in the jewel. And so, I mean, the idea is that we, we, have, to, we, we have to define some object which, which allows um, for extensions, right? So it, it, it allows to take the extension of any operator into a Banach lattice. So what I'm going to do is look at this particular operator, T, uh, which goes from the space E into say L finite dimensional L1, N dimensional uh, L1, which goes, this is a Banach lattice. And, and well, there are two things. So suppose, suppose first that I can, I can do this trick and I can, I can extend this operator to the free uh, Banach lattice. Uh, then I would like to know how the norms on the free Banach lattice should be, okay? So, well, if, if one thinks carefully, it's not, it's not very hard to see that, that the extension should have uh, this form, I'm writing here, right? And, and of course, uh, well, I just computed the norm of T, and as, as you might know, uh, this is exactly the weekly, uh, the one, weekly one summing norm of the sequence xi star, right? So this is the norm of T. So if I'm assuming that this operator T hat, this lattice homomorphism, 
preserves the norm, right? This is bounded with the same norm as, 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 as the original one. Then I get this inequality here, which if I write it again, uh, it, it, it's telling me that the norm of F has to be bigger than all these quotients. And well, rearranging things, this is, if, if this happens for any collection of points in the dual, then I get this um, inequality in the bottom line of the slide. Okay, so this is one way to see how this expression uh, comes from. I mean, the proof actually is to show that this uh, is actually an identity, okay? That this, this is an equal, not just a, it's not just bigger or equal than that, okay? So in a way it is, if you control how to extend things into L1, then that's it, right? You, you, can, you know how to extend things for, for other lattices. This makes sense because, of course, L1, the norm in L1 is maximal in some sense, right? Because of triangle inequality. So, so this makes sense that you have to look at what happens with L1. And if this works for L1, then this should work in general. Of course, this is just giving you the candidate and then some work has to be done to, to, to complete the, the, the proof. But, but that's the idea, okay? So maybe any questions up to now or? No? Okay. So, so, so let's start by looking at the simple possible cases. Um, um, it would be what happens if you start, for instance, with a finite dimensional Banach space? What is the free Banach lattice over that? Okay. Uh, before that, maybe uh, one comment in, which, which works in, 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 in more generality. If, if we denote, let, let, let us, yeah, let us denote uh, by C uh, pH of, of B, uh, the, the, the weak star continuous functions, which are positively homogeneous, okay? Weak star continuous on the ball, the dual unit ball, okay? So, um, one observation, if we look back at the, um, sorry, at the identity, uh, we have this bottom line here. Um, if I just take, uh, say, n equal one in this, uh, in this formula, uh, what I'm taking is the evaluation of, of the function f at points, which, which have to be on the ball, right? Saying that this is smaller than one for, for say, say, saying that this soup is smaller than one, uh, if I don't have this sum, it's just saying that, of course, this star has to be of norm smaller than one, right? So, um, so I get that the supremum norm, the uniform norm in, in, in the ball of E star, it's uh, bounded, it's, it's bounded from above by the um, free norm. Um, in th this is also, well, um, before that, uh, uh, another, another observation is that if I take um, the point evaluations, these deltas, they, they are, of course, uh, as I said, these are linear mappings. Of course, in particular, they are, they are homogeneous, not just positively homogeneous, and they are, they are weak style continuous, right? What happens if I start taking um, lattice combinations or linear combinations of those, uh, finite lattice and linear combinations of these deltas, then um, these are going to be weak star continuous as well, right? Because essentially, I mean, the, the finite suprema or finite infima of, of continuous functions is again a continuous function. And Positively homogeneity is also preserved, right? That's homogeneity in general is not because, well, you know that if you have like uh, minus the soup of two things is is not. Uh, it's it, it's actually the inf of of the opposite guys, right? So it's not. This is not uh, playing with negative signs. Is is not working in. In, in general with respect to homogeneity, but, but for positive scalars, this, this works. 
So um, if I start with positively homogeneous functions and, and, and I generate things which are always positively homogeneous and weak star continuous, the free space is going to be uh, the closure of, of such family of functions with respect to the free norm. But as we said, this free norm is, is stronger than the uniform norm. So in the end, all my limits, all my limits of these expressions have to be also weak star continuous. Okay. So in a way, um, I have this lattice injection. Okay. This is not, I have a lattice injection into the, of, of the free space into the space of positively homogeneous and weak star continuous functions on the dual unipole. Of course, with a different norm, right? The norm in the free space, it's, it's, it's stronger, right? Well, uh, not always. On the finite dimensional case, it is actually the same. Well, the norm is, um, it's different, but the spaces are the same. So if I start with a finite dimensional space, and, and this was done by the Pacter and Wickstead in the original paper, just by looking at a finite, uh, at the free Banach lattice of the finite set, but, but the same proof actually works for, for a finite dimensional Banach space. Then you can view this free Banach lattice as exactly the space of positively homogeneous weak star continuous functions. Or if you want just the, if you just look at the values on the sphere, which is enough to, once you, to, if, if you're playing with positively homogeneous functions, that should be enough. And, and that's it, right? So you have, you don't have a new space, you just have, well, a uh, space of continuous functions just with a different, slightly different norm. Of course, the, the equivalence constant will, will depend on a, on, on, on a dimension, on a dimen I mean, will be dimensional. And actually in, in, a, in, a, in a work in, in, in progress with Niels, Lawson, we, we actually proved that this cannot happen if you start with, if you start with a infinite dimensional Banach space, well, weakly compactly generated or say separable if you want, then the free space is not going to be lattice isomorphic to any space of continuous functions, okay, on a compact house of space. Okay, so this next uh, thing I want to, I want to, uh, in a way, I want to advertise uh, this um, object of free Banner lattice and, and compare it to the Lipschitz free spaces, uh, which is um, uh, well a very popular topic now. We already had a couple of of seminars on on Lipschitz free spaces, and 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 there are some analogies in in these two constructions, and I want to maybe spend uh, a couple of minutes in, in, in explaining this. Um, so on the left hand side, we have metric spaces here on the bottom, uh, M and N, these are metric spaces and every metric space can be embedded by this nonlinear uh, isometry into its free space in a way that every Lipschitz map uh, can be extended to a linear operator between the free spaces, right? So, so on the bottom we have metric spaces and on the, on the upper, up, upstairs we have uh, Banach spaces and, and bounded linear operators, okay? So, so yeah, so, so we have metric spaces with Lipschitz maps and we have uh, Banach spaces with linear operators. And when we're dealing with free Banach lattices, uh, the situation is very similar, but instead what we do, we, we start with uh, Banach spaces and bounded linear operators between them. And now we have this way to embed these spaces E via these um, deltas um, into a free Banach lattice so that the, la the linear operator is extended in a unique way to a lattice homomorphism. Okay, so and and I'm kind of I want to insist on on on, on maybe this makes uh, no sense in general to insist on this, but of course if you start with metric spaces which have 
no linear structure at all, it, it, it makes no sense to speak about non-linear isometries. But as you know, uh, one could even start considering a symmetric space a Banach space and, 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 and build the ellipsis free space over that Banach space. But as you probably know, this this uh, this new free space, I mean, the ellipsis the, the free space forgets in a way about this linear structure of the of the original space. And same happens on the right hand side. If I start with E um, a Banach lattice, I mean, a Banach space which happens to be a lattice for whatever reason. Uh, when I make this trick, when I make this construction of the free Banach lattice over E, in a way I'm forgetting about the lattice structure, okay? I'm introducing a new lattice structure on this free space and, and the original I had, it's pretty much forgotten, okay? So that's what I mean by, by saying that this also, this, these embeddings are, now they're linear isometries, but they're not lattice, right? even if the original space was a lattice. So in a way, you, you have to think of, of this generator, of, of the elements of E sitting into the free Banach lattice uh, over E as, as, as lattice-free generators, right? There, there's no lattice statement that you, can, um, that you can make to be true for this uh, generators on the free space, unless it was trivially true every, in every banner lattice, okay? So they are free in that sense. Okay, so, so I think um, this um, analogy is, is a very useful for, for at least to find out what should be the questions, uh, what are the questions one should understand in this, um, for this new construction of free Banach lattices, right? So because Lipschitz free spaces have been some years already around, uh, we have a better understanding of how, what are the kind of things we know. And of course, there are many things we don't know about them, but, but okay, we're going just one step further, one step behind and, and try to see uh, what, can, what can we mimic or what can find, uh, what, what are the analogs that one might expect in this, um, context of free banner lattices. Okay, so one of the things um, one might look at is um, that of a dual, what is the Banach space dual, and what would be a Banach lattice dual, um, if that, uh, if that made any sense at all. Um, well, in, in, in general, um, if I start with a Banach space, Sorry, if I start with a Banach lattice, um, say E, um, those, and then I look at, at, at E star, yeah, the Banach, the Banach space, um, the Banach space dual. Pedro, I have a question. Sure, yeah. Um, can you go to the previous slide? Please? Yes. So you can, if you have two metric spaces, like in the left, you can build the Lipschitz free spaces above them. Yes. And then you can build the free Banach lattices about. Yes. Above them. <laughs> yes. And so that's, that's a very interesting thing to look Is that still unique uh, relative to the metric spaces? I mean, so it, it has some extension property relative okay. to the metric spaces. I'm asking if it's unique still. Okay. Are, so, 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 um, Okay, so if you start with two metric spaces, which are by Lipschitz equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, the free spaces should be uh, isomorphic, right? Right. And then the free Banach lattice over those are right. lattice isomorphic. But uh, the interesting question is, uh, what happens with the converse, right, of this thing. If you start with, say, two free spaces which are lattice isomorphic, uh, does it necessarily follow that the underlying Banach spaces, or in this case, the underlying uh, metric spaces have to be uh, isomorphic in the corresponding uh, category? And this is, at all, this is not at all clear to me. This is actually the, the next thing I was going to mention, so. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, let me go back to this um, duality thing. Uh, so if I start with the Banach lattice and I take um, the Banach space dual, which of course it's it's all it's also a Banach lattice uh, uh, in a natural way. Um, I would I could look at those vectors here, right, on, on the on the dual, um, which are lattice homomorphisms, right, which would be kind of uh, th that would be kind of the dual in the in this category, right. But in general, um, this set might be empty, right. For instance, if you start with some L1 space over uh, a measure, then uh, having if, if, if you can define a lattice homomorphism, non-zero lattice homomorphism, of course, this is, this is because the measure mu has atoms. So in particular, if I start with L1 of zero one, uh, there's no, no way I can define a lattice homomorphisms from L1 into the reals, okay? But the situation for free spaces is uh, completely different. In free spaces, you have plenty of lattice homomorphisms into the reals, and they're actually uh, given by, by these evaluations, right? These are all the, the you, can, you can describe them all, which is um, helpful because uh, if, if you want to understand uh, exactly the question I was mentioning before, th this, if, if you have two free spaces, uh, two free Banach lattices, uh, which are lattice isomorphic, then what can you learn from the spaces, from the underlying Banach spaces? And so just playing with this idea uh, um, in a standard way with, with Niels, we, we proved uh, that actually every lattice homomorphism can be seen as a composition operator, right? So uh, you have this mapping uh, phi, uh, which maps uh, well, the dual of F into the dual of E, and which satisfies uh, certain properties, right? And, and now, well, one is, one would like to analyze uh, what kind of, of mappings uh, we have satisfying these, these, these properties and see if you can define them for E and F, uh, which are not necessarily isomorphic, okay? So, so this is a, an open problem. We, are, uh, we still don't know the answer. Right, so I will write it down, but if these are lattice um, isomorphic, uh, does it follow that E and F are Banach space isomorphic? Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing, um, I wanted to mention um, uh, how much time do I have left, Benjamin? Sorry, uh, it's like fifteen minutes. Um, we have a yeah, little more than ten minutes. Okay. So okay, uh, I might be skipping something, but anyway. So um, if a natural question is, is the following thing. So what happens when you start with a subspace F, a subspace of a Banach space E, how can you relate the free space over F with the free space over E, right? The free Banach lattice, I mean. Of course, in the, in the Lipschitz free situation, this is uh, very clear. This, this is just one subspace of the other. But the situation here, it's a bit different. Uh, if I start with a close up space, well, I, I have this, the formal inclusion, the, the, the isometry of F into E, uh, into isometry, I mean, uh, and, and this can be embedded to a lattice, this can be extended, sorry, to a lattice uh, injection, but just a lattice injection in general. So the question is, when is this injection um, really, uh, I mean, wh when can you make this injection an isomorphism, an into isomorphism? And of course, uh, it is very easy to see that if, if, if the space F was complemented, was a complemented subspace of E, then this is the case. And well, working a bit with this idea, one actually realized that, that this can be done uh, in, in more generality. If you have the subspace, uh, 
uh, f with the property that uh, there is some some uniform constant c so that any operator from this space f into finite dimensional l1 that make that makes an extension to the larger space without uh, increasing the norm up to this constant c okay and in that case then this injection is a lattice embedding i mean it's a lattice isom isomorphism into its image right so i can view the free banner lattice over f as a as a sub lattice of the free banner lattice over e but in general as i said this is this is not true so this is all uh, also in a joint work with uh, work in progress with with timur uh, mitchell and vladimir uh, and we realize there that if you take for instance the the rathamacher functions in a one uh, which of course is not a complemented subspace of a one, but uh, it has an even stronger property: is that the free space of the Radomacher functions is not is not a sub lattice of the free space of a one. Okay, uh, I mean this 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 uh, this injection at least doesn't give us uh, an embedding. Okay, um, so I wanted to mention um, a couple of applications of of this technology of free Banach lattices to address uh, some questions. Uh, and, and the first one I wanted to, to speak about is, it's a question which is attributed to Joe Distel. Uh, he, he, he mentioned this in 2011 in, in a conference in, in, in La Manga in Spain, uh, but maybe the question was around uh, a bit before. Uh, so the question is the following, suppose you have a Banach lattice X and suppose this is weakly compactly generated as a lattice. Uh, so I will explain what I mean by this uh, precisely in a minute. Uh, is necessarily this uh, weakly compactly generated Banach space? So of course, weakly compactly generated Banach spaces have been studied, well studied uh, in, the, in the literature and a lot of people have worked with this um, so but let me just briefly recall what i mean uh, so we say the banach space is weakly compactly generated if you have some weakly compact set so that the linear span is dense right and what we will call now lattice weakly compactly generated so if you have a banach lattice uh, we will say it is lattice weakly compactly generate, generated or lwcg if you can find a weakly compact set so that the lattice span of these elements uh, is dense, okay? So of course, weakly compactly generated Banach lattices are <laughs> trivially lattice weakly compactly generated. And the question, this the question was whether these two classes are the same or not. And well, in an earlier work with uh, some Spanish colleagues, we, we, we proved that some partial positive results. So for, for CFK spaces, these two notions are the same. Um, also for ordered continuous Banach lattices, uh, one can even prove something stronger than, than, than what I uh, claimed here. And, and this was done before we had any interest on, on, on free Banach lattices, of course, and it was a surprise when... Sorry. Yes. Uh, might you please remind uh, what was lattice uh, span um, of the compact K? So, so the lattice span is uh, you take uh, vectors K1, K, Kn in K, and then you start making all possible uh, combi lattice combinations of them, right? Finite, right? And you can you can use sums as well right you can sums suprema and infima and that's it and then you take the closure of these finite expressions and this is everything in the case where you have thank you mm. so um so if it's a very simple uh thing to see is that if you start with a weakly compactly generated banner space and you look at the free banner lattice this is automatically lattice weakly compactly generated because well if i have some set k which is compact weakly compact in e um, that means the, the the span of k is dense right so if i have this uh, embedding of 
the free space, this is an isometric embedding. So in particular, uh, the image of, del of, of K by delta, which sits in here, it's a weakly compact set. And just by definition, it, it span, its lattice span has to be everything. Okay? So every time I start with a Banach space, which is weakly compactly generated, the free space is going to be lattice weakly compactly generated. And it, it, actually one can show that if X is a Banach lattice, which is a lattice weakly compactly generated, um, so we have, uh, well, actually one can, one can show, um, this is not very hard to see that, one can find some uh, weakly compactly generated space with the property that uh, there is a, a lattice homomorphism with dense image from, from the free space into X. So essentially this is telling us that if you want to understand this question, it's enough if you understand what happens with free spaces. So is it true that every time I start with a weakly compactly generated Banach space, the free Banach lattice is also weakly compactly generated, not just lattice weakly compactly generated, but weakly compactly generated? And, and the answer is no. And, and, and this was um, actually, you just take Hilbert space, right? Which is, well, you take Hilbert L2 space over an uncountable uh, index set, and this happens to be, of course, lattice weakly compactly generated. The free space over this is lattice weakly compactly generated because, because, because the Hilbert space is, is reflexive, so it's weakly compactly generated. But it's not weakly compactly generated um, when gamma is uncountable. And this is because, actually, what you can put is L1 of gamma inside of, inside of this space. Sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah, well, I had some comments on this, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm skipping this. It is, the, the, the proof, once you know what you have to do, it's as usual, the proof is not complicated, but uh, it took us a while to, to, to figure out that, that this was going to be the counterexample. But um, what is also interesting is the following thing. Well, actually the proof for L2 works exactly the same for, for P smaller than, than two, okay? So none of these spaces are weakly compactly generated as long as uh, the index set gamma is uncountable. Surprisingly, for the other side of two, uh, these are. I mean, the free space, the free Banach lattice over LP, for P larger than two, no matter which index set uh, we take, and same happens with, with the free Banach lattice over C0, they are weakly compactly generated. And well, I'm not, I don't have time to, to speak about this, but, but for me, this was very surprising. Okay, so, okay, we have very little time. So for the last few minutes, let me mention another, another application of, of, of free banal lattices to, to address uh, another question. Uh, this is related to bi-basic um, sequences in Banach lattices. Um, this notion was, I think it was introduced by Kumenchuk, Karlova, and Popov in 2015. And then uh, Mitchell, Taylor, and Vladimir Troitsky, uh, they have a very recent paper on, on, this, um, on this and, and other notions. And they, they, they really... <laughs> They did great, so they analyzed very carefully this, this notion, and there's a lot of interesting questions, so I'm advertising this paper for you to, to read it. Um, so the notion is the following. Um, uh, we say that a, a sequence in a Banach lattice is bi-basic if, uh, well, if there's a constant m, so that whenever you take any sequence of scalar, say k, uh, you have this control for the soups, for the for the consecutive soups over the partial sums. Okay. If I had this supremum outside of the norm, right? That would be exactly what we say: basic pseudo basic sequence, right? That the norm of these partial sums is uh, is bounded uniformly uniformly bounded. Okay, so uh, in particular, these sequences satisfying this property are going to be uh, by basic sequences. They, they are stronger than basic. They have 
they have nicer properties. Uh, actually, what, uh, what is in the paper by Mitchell and, and Vladimir is that, well, if you start with, uh, well, this is not, this is not uh, well stated here. So if, if, if I start, say, uh, with a basic sequence, uh, then uh, if I look at the sequence of partial sums, then saying that the sequence is by basic is that the sequence of partial sums, they not only converge with respect to the norm, but they are also converging in the order of the lattice, okay? Because we are always working, given a, an ambient uh, space, a, a, a banner lattice, okay? All right, um, so, well, one, one comment maybe, uh, if your ambient space, if your, if, if X were a space of continuous functions on some Hausdorff space, then this notion is exactly the same as, um, as that of basic sequence, right? Because the norm in, in, in CFK spaces or in an L infinity space uh, satisfies that these, these two things are, are the same, right? So I can take the soups out of the, out of the norm. So um, for spaces of continuous functions, a sequence is by basic if and only if it is uh, basic. So um, maybe this is a motivation for the following question. Uh, is it true that every subspace of a Banach lattice contains a by basic sequence? Right? Because on Banach spaces, we, we can always find basic sequences, right? And, and, and is the same true for, for this notion of by basic? And this is the last thing I'm going to mention. Uh, in our work with, with Timur, uh, Mitchell, and, and Vladimir, we could show that actually, if you look at the free Banach lattice over, over C0 or L2, the canonical copy of the original space in, in this subspace, in this isometric subspace, in the free space is not, in the free Banach lattice, does not contain any bi basic sequence. Okay? And, and the hard part of the proof is to show that. If you look at the unit vector basis of C0, this is not going to be by basic on the free space with respect to that uh, order. Once you know that, then, well, you can, of course, there's still some work to do, but we, we can use some stability results uh, of by basic sequence that were proved by Mitchell and, and Vladimir. And, and some of our um, uh, earlier results about subspaces of, of free banner lattices. And, and, and with that, uh, one can conclude that, that there are subspaces without any by basic sequence. Okay, and, and I think that's all for now. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Pedro. That was a very nice talk. Um, so we can open for questions now. Can I uh, say something? Sure. Uh, thank you for your talk. I want to mention in connection with your answer to Gideon that uh, there is a well-known and simple example of uh, metric spaces which are not by Lipschitz equivalent, but the free space is the same. You can see that any uh, infinite trees, two infinite trees, which are not by Lipschitz equivalent. It is easy to construct such trees. Uh, and the Lipschitz free space in both cases is just L1. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in this, uh, I mean, in what you said, uh, it was not clear that such example exists. This is why I want to mention that there are well-known simple examples of the cases where it is known that Lipschitz free spaces are the same, but the spaces are actually far from each other. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, mm, my question is whether, uh, sorry, the, the same happens uh, this, I would say that one should be able to construct examples which are um, that is isomorphic, but the spaces are not uh, Banner space isomorphic. I, I, I also think that this that this would be this would be the <laughs> the right thing, but uh, uh, I have still no idea how to prove that. Yeah, I never thought about it, so I cannot comment on this. Excuse me, uh, uh, Professor Tradasachi, uh, since you mentioned that you have a result uh, telling that 
uh, free Banach um, lattice space uh, on LP uh, gamma is uh, lattice weakly compactly generated. Uh, I was wondering, have you ever uh, worked in the direction of uh, showing conditions under which the projective tensor product, but but uh, better to say positive projective tensor product of that same space with itself uh, turns into lattice weakly compactly generated? Does this make sense? Thank uh, you. It, it makes sense, but no. I mean, to be honest, I, I have never considered this. Yeah, it's yeah. I suppose it's, it's a natural question to ask, but no, I don't know. Another thing I just wanted to mention, when you say the uh, homo lattice homomorphism of two elements, you can also just, it's a matter of preference, uh, sorry, defining the homomorphism for an operator. You can say that the uh, modulus of an operator applied on an element is the operator applied on the modulus of the element. Yes, that's equivalent. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, also, Pedro, thank you for this nice lecture. Uh, I was wondering about, again, your nice question, whether when the free spaces are lattice isomorphic, does it follow that the Banner spaces are isomorphic? Uh, if you take, <coughs> uh, say, uh, two different isometric preliors of little L1, is there any chance, I mean, these are relatively handleable spaces, is there any chance that the corresponding uh, free lattices of them could be isomorphic? For instance, if you, do, if you take two CK spaces, CK and CL, with K and L countable compact spaces, can mm. you say anything about the corresponding free banal lattices of them? Um, I think in, the, in this case, we can, in some cases, we can distinguish them, but not in, uh, in general, I, um, at least it's not coming right now. Uh, in general, I, uh, I don't know, but, but, but I can distinguish some, some examples. Yes, it can be, it can be done. Uh, the thing is that I identifying the, Free Banach lattices. I mean, these are huge spaces, right? As you can as you can expect. So, I mean, it's not always. It's it's just not easy to work with them. Um, it's not clear what the what is the free Banach lattice over a space of continuous functions. It's uh, in general, it's not it's not clear to me. Yeah. So, thank you, Pedro. I ask a question, please. First of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. In your original, the beginning in the definition, you see you have, you have this operator T from E to X, and this you obtain operator T tilde from ELF of E to X, and it's also bounded with the same norm. But I'm wondering if T has other properties, can you can you deduce properties of T tilde? Like compactness or things like that. T is right? compact. Can T tilde be compact? Uh, I think in general, um, the answer is no. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it is. I think um, so. Uh, th there's one thing I was trying to to do is the following thing. Of course, uh, we know that. Um, if you start with LP and say LQ with with Q smaller than P, right? Every every operator here it's it's going to be compact, and right because of Pitt's theorem, um, these are compact. Um, so I was trying to exploit that idea to see whether the same thing could be said for lattice homomorphisms between uh, the free space over LP and the free space over LQ. And in that situation, uh, well, it's not exactly this. <laughs> it's not exactly what you're saying, but, but, but uh, one can prove that every lattice homomorphism from LP to LQ has to be compact. 
And this is, this, in a way, what you're doing is, if you start with a lattice homomorphism, uh, basically what you do is you restrict your attention to what happens here. And, and because this operator is compact, uh, it, it makes sense that the extension, uh, which is in a way um, defined by, by, by well, it, 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 it is defined by, by the restriction in a, in a unique way, this should be compact as well. But I think in this case, it makes, uh, it is important that, that the space LQ has uh, an unconditional basis and that actually compactness can be checked by, by truncating uh, to finite, finite dimensional pieces. And I wouldn't say in general, if you start with, a, with an operator, the extension has to be compact. And well, actually, uh, it's not even true that if you start with a finite dimensional operator, a finite rank operator, the lattice extension has to be compact because, um, um, yeah, so what happens if I take um, the identity, right, on say, uh, sorry, so take the identity on a finite dimensional, let's say, L2N to L2N, um, when I take the free space over L2n, uh, this is, I said, this is, uh, this is isomorphic to the space of, of continuous functions on the sphere, right? And if I extend this, right, the, what I get is actually the identity, okay? So, so of course, um, this is not, this is an identity on infinite dimensional space, so it's, it's not compact at all, right? But, but sometimes you can do things. I mean, the, I think what really helps you if you want to control uh, properties of the extension is, the, is, is that you know, whenever you have a, 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 an operator like this, uh, that the extension to the free space has uh, the same norm, right? So if you can argue in a way that um, if you have some approximation to an operator and you, and you know that the error in this approximation is going to zero in norm, then, <laughs> then if you can argue that the extension of those errors are, are the errors of the approximation to the extended operator, then uh, maybe you can use this uh, Maybe you can use this uh, this kind of inequality. So, so I think this is the idea behind what I was trying to explain about the the free spaces over LP and LQ. Uh, this is actually what 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 I think happened. That that the uh, finite dimensional approximations, uh, when you extend them, uh, the error that you get with the with respect to the extension can be controlled by the error you had in the in the original level of the at, the, at the original level of the spaces. So if you have convergence on one side, you get convergence upstairs. But, but this is a very peculiar example, I would say. In general, as I said, it is, it is a very different thing. I don't know if this is a train. Thank you. I Thank may you. butt in with one more quick question. Sure here with real Banach spaces, no complex You have a complex Banach space, there's some analog of this where your free Banach lattice over the space of the complexified Banach lattice. Has that happened trivially or? I'm not, hearing, I'm not hearing you very well. I think the microphone, it's uh, I working. think he said something about complex. Actually. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm dealing all the time with real uh, Banach spaces. Uh, most of it should work for complex spaces, but I haven't checked. Honestly, I haven't checked, so I don't know. But most of it should work. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, please. Okay, hi, Pedro. Hello. Uh, can you put again the uh, that slide comparing the the, the 
Sure. If she's free spaces and uh, free Banna Gladys. Yeah. Right. Okay. So when we are in the Lipschitz free space setting, there's um, in case that M is actually a Banach space, so you can go down with an arrow with the body center map, right? Yes. Uh, so this is very, yes. very interesting. Like when you have a, for example, a finitely supported measure there in the free space, you can think of it as, as really the body center of that, of that mass. So this is a left, this becomes a left inverse for the delta, for the delta map. So I was, I was wondering if you have something similar in the Fibonacci lattice case, meaning uh, if you have the, if the, you start with an E, which is our, uh, with a, which is a lattice, a Banach lattice. So do you have a left inverse for the delta? Uh, uh, which is uh, a lattice iso uh, isomorphism. Yes, uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, the first time I got this question was, uh, I think it was Valentin who, who mentioned this. Uh, so it is true that, so if, if my original Banach space E happens to be a, a Banach lattice, right? Because of the universal property, if I look at the just the identity operator, right? Uh, I can extend it, right? And, and I'm going to call this just exactly the same way uh, you would be calling it, this body center map, which gives you uh, exactly, as you said, uh, an inverse for, for, for delta, right? Um, so it, it, it gets back to the identity. In, I think in, in the Lipschitz free uh, spaces, uh, it's the result by Carlton and, and Godefroy that if you're working with, uh, please correct me if, I'm, if I say something wrong here. If, I think if you work with separable spaces, that, that's okay, right? You can always find uh, a way back, right? Correct, absolutely, Pedro. Okay, so uh, the question is what happens now uh, with, um, in, in, in this situation? Um, and this is also actually, maybe I should mention, this is work in progress also with Antonio Aviles, um, Jose Rodriguez, and, and Gonzalo Martinez Cervantes. What we observed is that um, in some cases, for some lattices, you can, you can go back. I mean, for instance, if you have um, a space with an unconditional basis, so take LP, there's an embedding, J, from LP into the free space of LP. Not, not, not delta, right? Delta is, is, as I said before, delta is not a, a lattice embedding, right? This one is a lattice embedding with the property that when I take the body center map, I, I have the identity, okay? So this can be done, as I said, for LP, uh, actually for Banach spaces with an unconditional basis. It can be done for, for some CFK spaces, and, 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 if, and it can be done if E happens to be, for instance, the free Banner lattice over some other space, right? Which I think it's a similar thing happens for, for the Lipschitz free spaces, right? No matter what size the, the, the Lipschitz free space uh, has. But in general, it's, it's not, uh, in, in, in the case of CFK spaces, you can, I think you can build, a, examples where you don't have this, this property. So, yeah, I think this is uh, related to what you were asking, right, Pedro? Yes, thank you, Pedro. All right, so thank you to both Pedros. Um, so are there any questions or let me stop recording and we can continue the conversation after this. Okay, thank you so much again for a beautiful talk.